I'm going to preach on something that may not be appropriate for children. I, and I, I'm going to be discreet, I'm going to be appropriate, but you know, I have this, uh, this philosophy in life that as an expository preacher, when I come to a place in Scripture, I preach it. I preach it like it's written, and I try to preach it thoroughly and correctly. And so uh, we happen to be on a passage that deals with, are you ready for this? I'll spell it out. S-E-X. All right, now that you've got the shock of that. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4, it says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. So, there it is. That's our passage. That's what we're going to talk about today. Again, I say, I'm going to be appropriate, but my second point is going to deal with human sexuality. You know, America has so cheapened human sexuality, it has so marketed human sexuality, that we all have kind of a warped view of it. Now, you know, every subject is not appropriate to speak about in every situation. It is not appropriate in a crowded theater to holler, fire! It is both a state and federal offense to shout fire in a crowded theater. Because you know what the results would be, panic. So this is not a, you know, something that we talk about a lot openly, but it is still a big part, a big thread as a part of human life. Now I'm gonna surprise some of you, but I want you to understand the title of this message is Marriage was made in heaven. And so I want you to understand from the very beginning, regardless of what we say concerning marriage, and may I be so bold, the marriage bed. It was made in heaven. And so it is good. So how do you know it was good? Because God said all six days of creation that's good, that's good, that's good, that's good, that's good, that's good. And on the sixth day, at the end of the day, he said, that's very good. And I'll have you to remember that at the end of the sixth day, after God made the man and then made the woman, and then joined them together in holy matrimony in the same day, hi, I'm Adam, hi, I'm Eve. And God says, now I pronounce you man and wife. It happened. God said, it's very good. It's very good. So, in its appropriate context, human sexuality is not a dirty thing. It's not an ugly thing. It is something that should be treated with discretion. And there are such things as are age appropriate and age inappropriate. When children are young, they don't care about the human sexuality. What is that? I don't want to hear about that. Ooh. Kiss a girl, ooh, you know? God gave children the ability to live a less complicated life. And I say to that, praise God, because life gets real complicated when you become a teenager. All of a sudden the hormones rage, your chemistry changes and things get weird. You don't, you know, it, it was all, you know, cowboys and John Wayne and football and fishing and all of a sudden it's, she smells good. She's got pretty hair. And it's okay. But it is, uh, like I said, because there's been so, so much abuse and so much misuse, it becomes a difficult thing. And so let's try to take some of the difficulty out of it. This is one verse of Scripture. Remember, the writer of Hebrews has laid out his foundation for the supremacy of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is the business of which God is at work. He is God's message to the world. God's spoken in so many ways, but he's speaking to us now through Jesus. He is better. He is better. He is better on every way, a better sacrifice, a better priesthood, a better altar. He's a better everything. 
And so at the end of the book, here's the last chapter. He's fixing to close it out. The courier is ready to carry the message to the churches. He's got to throw a few words in there to give stability to people who are living in an unstable world. Now, it is most likely that during the time that the book of Hebrews is being written, the Roman army is more and more edgy. They're escalating. The people of Israel, especially in the city of Jerusalem, they've been resisting the Romans. But they haven't come in and destroyed the temple yet because of the references to an extant temp temple. The writer of Hebrews was living before 70 A.D. It was writing before 70 A.D. But they were turbulent times. The war was uh, on the horizon, and Jerusalem is going to be surrounded, and it's going to be destroyed. And these people who all their lives have grown up in Judaism, and they're used to the law and the temple and the sacrifice and the ritual and the holy days... All of a sudden, they found that this man from Galilee, this man from Nazareth, is the one that everybody's been looking for. He is the anointed one. He is the promised one. He is the Messiah. And so their whole lives have been turned right side up. Where the Pharisees and the, the emptiness of religion that, that Judaism has degraded into had been teaching them about form and rules and regulations, all of a sudden this one comes on the scene and he talks about life and liberty and wholeness and being born again. It's radical, it's extreme, it's reality, it's the truth. And so these people, many of them, the reason it was written to the Hebrews, because they were going through the dispersion. James also follows that theme. He's talking to those in the dispersion, those are who are being scattered. Jerusalem's not destroyed yet, but it's getting kind of edgy, and a lot of families are saying, you know what, let's move, let's move out to the country. Let's get out of the city, because it's, it's not going to bode well for us. It's going to get bad. And so he's trying to speak into them uh, things of stability. So in this 13th chapter, he's, he's talked about brotherly love and entertaining strangers and remembering folks in prayer. He's trying to, a, a few words on each subject. And now he says, and by the way, what God said about marriage in the beginning, it's the same. It's bedrock. It's how God made it to be. Marriage was made in heaven. It's a designed relationship. <coughs> well, you know, me and my old lady, we do as we please, all right? Go read the book of Judges and find out what happened to people that did what was right in their own eyes. Not a good picture. You have a weapon in your home. You know there are things that you do with it and things you don't do with it. From the time I was a little bitty fella, and I had a Roy Rogers cap gun. My wife had one too. She was a cowgirl, and I didn't even know it. And I found out after I married her, she was a cowgirl too. What do you know? Although she played the Indian, Indian princess most of the time when they played, but she had a Roy Rogers cap pistol. Had that pretty shiny plastic rhinestone on the side. From the time I was a little bitty fella, my daddy said, don't you point that at anybody ever. Now, he wasn't out there when we were playing army and cowboys and Indians out in the yard. But when, when I was in the house and, and he could see me, he said, you never point a gun. But, Daddy, it's just a toy. He says, you never point a gun at anybody that you don't expect to shoot. Those are hard words to a six-year-old. But the idea is there is appropriate behavior and there is inappropriate behavior. And some things are intended for one purpose, but they're not intended for another. I have a wonderful concrete slab underneath my house. It's, it provides a pretty stable floor, but I don't sleep on it. It's hard and it's cold. You see, you use things in appropriate situations. You know, salt is good. Uh, you need a little bit of salt. If you don't have a little bit of sodium in your diet, you're going to have problems. 
But if you get too much of it, it'll kill you. Amen? Even water. Every time I think of, of, of excess, I think of the poor woman that entered the radio contest to be the person who could drink the most amount of water in a short time. She died from drinking too much water too quick. Wow. So something that is good and necessary and essential and something that is good in its appropriate setting becomes very deadly. There's a plant that grows in many of our yards. It's akin to the tomato plant. It's called nightshade. It's commonly known as deadly nightshade. Now, if you ever went to an optometrist during the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and probably the first decade of this century, they made a derivative from deadly nightshade and put it in your eyes to make them dilate so they could do the proper treatment on your eyes and diagnose and do all the things that they do. But if you were to eat portions of that plant, it would kill you graveyard dead. Used appropriately, it's a good thing. Used inappropriately. I've heard so many people say, well, God made weed, so we ought to smoke it. You know, they always say, well, George Washington grew hemp. Yeah, they made rope out of it. They didn't smoke it. I mean, really, think about it. The idea of breathing the smoke from burning leaves, I mean, is that intelligent or not? Anyway, I don't want to get off on that. But you see my point. Used appropriately, it's a good thing. Used inappropriately, it's destructive. Hebrews 13, 4, marriage is honorable in all. Let's look at that. Honorable means it is honored. It is esteemed as valuable. It is esteemed as something that is precious. And may I speak into the 21st century and say marriage is something that needs to be respected and valued and treated as a valuable thing. What's the most valuable object in your house? For many people, it's that 70 inch screen, Bliss Maddox came up yesterday in food ministry. Brother, I went out and treated myself. I got a good review on my job and I went out and bought me a 70, what do you say, 75 inch TV. And uh, he was so proud of that. I said, well, I got to come see it. You know, I said, that thing is as wide as I am tall. I got to see, that's probably the most valuable thing in his house. I don't, you know, sometimes we, well, I guess refrigerators have gotten expensive, haven't they? I understand people are spending $1,000 to $2,000 for a washer and dryer nowadays. I never spent that much. I hope I never have to. Whatever the most valuable thing in your house is, I mean, really valuable, you take care of it. You, I mean, especially those things that great-great-grandmama had, and she passed it on to grandmama, and she passed it on to mama, and mama passed it on to you, and it's something pretty, and it's something delicate, and you just don't, you don't, put it by the door as a door stopper. You treat it with respect. That's what we ought to do with marriage. And the writer of Hebrews is saying in just a few words, folks, just like God said from the beginning, God created marriage, God designed marriage, God instituted marriage, and you need to treat it the way that God treats it. Now, we are in to intentionally hold this covenant in, in view and in value. Now, covenant, I said. Well, covenant, contract, that's all marriage is, just a contract between two people. No, no. A contract is an agreement that can be nullified by one or both parties. Did you know that? A contract is something that you can get out of. Now, usually a contract spells out exactly how you get out of it and what it will cost you and what it won't cost you. As a matter of fact, if you understood the nature of a contract, a contract is an agreement between two parties that limits responsibility. 
we bought our house back in uh, 1996. Moved into it on the 13th of, De of December, 1996. We made a contract with the, uh, the previous owners of the house and with the bank and with all other interested parties, everybody was in on that agreement, um, that we would only pay, I believe it was $82,000. Was that it? Somewhere in that. We, now we had a down payment and we had a mortgage, but it all together, we made an agreement. Uh, let's just say $82,000. Okay. I got into that contract with them because I did not want to pay $85,000. I did not want to pay $105,000. I wanted to limit my responsibility to just the portion that I agreed to. Now, on the other side of that coin, here's the bank and the previous owners. And they are entering into that contract to say to me, you will pay $82,000 and not eighty-one five. You see, a contract is designed to limit responsibility. That's why you always want to go over contract. Make sure that you're satisfied with the terms. Now, why do I say all of that? Because a covenant is vastly different. A covenant is a binding agreement with unlimited responsibility. It's a wonderful thing that people do when they love someone. They will sign on the line to unlimited responsibility. What does God mean when God says marriage? Well, let me ask you this question. What is the length of time spanned by the marriage covenant till death do us part. And you and I know that we're going to be friends in heaven right on. Even though we're not married in heaven, we'll be friends. But marriage says, as long as y'all are breathing, you're going to keep this covenant. And, you know, the disciples, when Jesus was describing it, they said, whoa, <laughs> if that's the case with marriage, maybe a guy ought not to get married because, whoo, that's a lot of responsibility. Nancy Sinatra sang that song, we got married in a fever hotter than a pepper sprout. We've been thinking about Jackson ever since the flame went out. They didn't understand the business of covenant. By the way, you want to understand a covenant? God made a covenant with you. He said that whosoever believes in his son will not perish but have everlasting life. Ooh. Say praise God. Praise God. What a covenant. That's the new covenant. And I'm a signer. Jesus ratified it in his death, in his resurrection. But I'm a signer because I'm a believer. What are the uh, terms and conditions in which the marriage covenant applies? For better and for, in, for richer and for in sickness and in forsaking all others. Keep thee only unto him or her. As long as you both shall live. Now, I don't need to go into a lot of detail to tell you how we have degraded that. As a matter of fact, we've had about 40, 50 years of degrading the covenant of marriage so much that we have fewer and fewer young people that are even entering into the covenant anymore. I don't mean to be hard or offensive. But if you live together and you are not married, you are shacking up. And that God describes as fornication. Look it up. You can't have the milk without buying the cow. It is wrong to degrade marriage. Wrong. Or anything that goes along with marriage. It is wrong to degrade it. 
to cheapen it, to barter it, to sell it. Or to say, well, we're just two consenting adults. I don't care if you're consenting adults. You are consenting to evil. And if you happen to read the last part of this, the last word of this verse is judge. And that's what you have to look forward to when you step all over the covenant that God established. Marriage was made in heaven. We cannot, uh, should not degrade marriage by cheapening it or prohibiting it. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, it says that in the last days there will be a lot of liars running around, weird philosophies, basically saying, well, you shouldn't eat meat, you, you shouldn't marry, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. It's a doctrine of devils. You're cheapening marriage. I remember in 1974, there were these... Uh, two guys coming through town. We lived in Eustis, Florida. They were running around. They were wearing bed sheets, ser seriously, white bed sheets, and they were wearing sandals because they said, we're like Jesus, see? You know, <laughs> if I put on a dress, it doesn't make me a woman. But anyway, uh, they were dressed up in a bed sheet and they were dressed in sandals and their philosophy was no killing, no sex, no materialism is the way of the kingdom of God. Now, I, I understand that this purity of life is a good thing, and realizing that God has set boundaries on our behavior, that's a good thing. But the last time I looked, that, that by the works of the law shall no men be justified. But one of the things they did, that oh, you can't get married. You can't, marriage is wrong. It's evil. Um, so that's another way that you cheapen or, or uh, degrade marriage by prohibiting it. Now let's go back to the beginning, because that's what Jesus did. Every time he was asked about something, he went back to the beginning. They asked him about marriage, and I'll cite Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. And the Lord God said, by the way, up to this point in creation, for five days God said, that's good, that's good, that's good, that's good. But there about midways of the sixth day, after he had taken a bunch of mud, by the way, the name Adam means clay colored. Adam means we look like dirt because that's what God made us out of and what separated us from everything else that God just spoke out of the dirt in the case of man he formed him out of the dirt and the thing that separated mankind from everything else is God went he breathed into man the spirit of life that's more than just animation that's more than just bios life it is it is life that transcends just physical boundaries. But even then, when he made this man in his own image and after his own likeness, God said, that's not good. What do you mean? I thought everything God did was good. Well, he does, but he's not finished yet, you see. And if you get incomplete, you try to have this without that. People are trying to have some aspects of marriage without the other aspects of marriage. It's not right. And God said, that's not good. What he said was, it's not good for the man to be alone. And I will make an easer who easers. If I may anglicize that word. The word easer in the Hebrew means help or helper. And it's used twice in this verse. God said, I will make a, a helper who helps, a completer who completes, a help that is suitable for him. And it's in, the, in the Hebrew, it's easer, easer. I'm making a helper who helps, a completer who completes. And just to make it very clear, God didn't dip some mud this time when he made her. He put Adam to sleep, took a chunk of living flesh. I guess in a, in a broad sense we could say this was cloning, but it doesn't go through the standard procedure of cloning. God just took this, and of that rib of his flesh, God made the improved version. Woman, the one who was made for man. And he brought them together, and Adam said, Whoa, man! He didn't really. He said, Isha. Man is Ish. Woman is Isha, out of the man. She was suitable. As a matter of fact, old Bill was the best 
puzzle maker that I ever knew. He is the king of the puzzle makers. You get two pieces and they just fit perfectly. That was Adam and Eve. Perfect fit. Well, that's because they weren't sinners yet, you see. They got along real well. They lived in a perfect environment with a perfect God, with a perfect wife, with a perfect husband. I mean, a perfect job. They had everything perfect. And then they messed it up for all the rest of us. But before there was sin, remember this. They were made, they were married before sin came into the world. Some people say, well, they didn't have any sexual uh, relations. No, don't give me that gunk. Because on the very day they were married, God said, y'all be fruitful and multiply and fill this earth with little ones. Basically, that's what he said. I was telling some of the guys earlier that I embarrassed both my daughters. I'm glad Faith's not in here because she'll turn red because I perform both of the weddings of our youngest two daughters. And at the end of the ceremony, there was a popular phrase from that uh, I don't know what Disney movie it was, but after I pronounced them man and wife, I told their now husbands, kiss the girl. And that's what God said to Adam. Kiss the girl. Now, don't be uncomfortable with that. God made them for each other. Look at verse 21. The Lord God caused, this is in Genesis 2, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and, and he slept, and he took one of the ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man made he a woman. And nobody in their right mind is going to dispute the fact that he improved on the human race. Thank God for that. And he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. You know, God put, took him on a little trip before all this happened. He let him see all those animals, and they're all paired up, and they've all got their mate, and eh, ain't nobody for me. Boy, I remember that feeling. I was one lost puppy until I found my wife. Oh, I'm telling you, I understand this completeness thing. It means a great deal to me to have this dear friend and companion by my side. Adam didn't have anybody like that. But you see, God was showing him, I got a surprise for you, and now you're going to appreciate it even more. And she shall be called Isha, woman, because she was taken out of the man. Therefore, here's the wedding, here's the marriage, we say this today. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother. There ain't no fathers and mothers yet. The two potential father and mother, they're right there. But God is performing a wedding ceremony that he expects to be respected in the future. So shall a man leave his father and mother. You know, there's two important actions in marriage. Leave and cleave. One means uh, I'm no longer under the umbrella of my parents' authority but I'm going to cleave to my spouse. I am under, the, the, uh, this is a new authority under God. We are establishing a new household. By the way, you'll get along a whole lot better with your in-laws and in-laws, you get a whole lot better, get along a whole lot better with your kids if you will respect the priesthood of their home because they're not under your priesthood anymore. They leave in order to cleave. Look, a man can't serve two masters. You've got to have each unit, each little unit. You know, even a, in the army, they, got, they, got, they break it down into divisions and all this stuff. And finally, the, 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 I guess a platoon. They got a sergeant. And these guys are not running around looking for the lieutenant. All they got to do is follow their sergeant. They've got a chain of command. Now, marriage is designed for this. God said that it's honorable. There's so many reasons we don't have time to talk about them. But the man leaves his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they shall be one flesh. One man, one woman, one lifetime is the divine pattern that Jesus affirmed. Read Matthew 19, verses 1 through 12. Jesus was implicit. Jesus was clear on this subject. May I also say at this point, 
It's important to say that divorce is not the unpardonable sin, okay? Divorce is not the unpardonable sin because Jesus himself said, God granted Moses the authority to establish something that is called divorce. But do you understand that he also said in that context, but it was because your hearts are hard. And there are situations where a heart is hard. And we can read about that at, at other passages in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and 7. There's some discussion of that. And uh, just understand that God's pattern, one man, and by the way, male and female, period. Jesus said that. So don't, don't take today's philosophy as being acceptable. So, that being said, let's get to the hard part. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. The word that the writer of Hebrews used as the Holy Spirit led him is a word that means unsoiled. So, okay. The marriage bed or human sexuality is unsoiled. It is undefiled. Now, some people say that sexuality is dirty. No, no it's not. Any more than a teaspoon from your uh, kitchen drawer is dirty. Now if I take that spoon out and I dig in the manure pile with it, it's dirty. And you ain't gonna use it until it's been sterilized again, amen? Marriage is, and, and the human sexuality is not dirty, but if you degrade it, you cause it to become dirty. There's nothing wrong with a spoon, but you can make it dirty or you can use it clean. Of course, you stick it in your mouth, it's going to be dirty anyway, but that's, you, you don't go too far with the metaphor. The marriage bed is unsoiled, undefiled. Now, let me give you three reasons that God created such a thing as the marriage bed. Now, let's just be perfectly clear. Human sexuality and all of the fireworks and all of the tingles and all of the warm feelings were created and hardwired into his creation by God. The marriage bed, human sexuality, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but it was designed to be very, very pleasant. I'll go back to that in a minute. Let's deal with this first one. The marriage bed was, was definitely designed for procreation, okay? Let's understand that. And, you know, it doesn't take a whole lot of a studying of sociology to know that there would be no babies born in the world if there wasn't something pleasant enough to get a guy to take off his hunting boots and leave his rifle at the door and hang around with his wife. If there wasn't something, I'm not saying that's all there is to marriage relationship, but I'm saying to you that if it wasn't the way that God made it, God's smart, God knows what he's doing. Did you ever wonder why everything in the world doesn't taste like celery? Because you're supposed to eat strawberries, unless you're allergic to them. You're supposed to eat apples. You're supposed to eat bananas. You're supposed to eat, and maybe you hate the thought of it, but to me, okra tastes good. God made things to be uh, pleasing in a sensory sort of way. Now, you can get so sensory that you get so carnal that, that you, you can't listen to the Spirit of God. But I'm saying that we have flesh. We, part of us is flesh. We're going to drag this flesh with us through this world. And if it, was, if it didn't feel good to lay down at night, some people are such workaholics, they'd never sleep. But God made it pleasant to lay down and close your eyes. And ah, God made it pleasant to fill the empty belly so you would eat and you would be nourished. And God made human sexuality a pleasant thing so that there would be procreation. 
Now notice, what was the purpose of, of marriage? Well, God told the, the two of them. He, he wanted the miracle of ongoing life to take place. And it takes place in the expression of love and affection. Think about that. I'm treading on eggshells here, but I've I got to say this. I have three adopted children, but I have two natural children. I love them all the same. They're, oh, I love them all. But I look at the two that are my children and all the other things I think about them. I think about the fact that they were the result of the affection that I have for my wife. I'm thinking, well, that's a good place to come from from the bond of commitment and affection and delight in one another. God packaged it that way so there would be kids. Genesis 1.28, I mean, this is as basic as it gets, and that's why Jesus cited it when he was asked on the question. God blessed them and God said unto them, go have kids. Beef and they think but one way to have kids, okay? Before or after the fall. Now, no children were conceived or born before the fall. We don't know how long it was. I, you know, there's nothing in Scripture that tells us how long it was for the time that Adam and Eve were created in their innocency and Eve got conned by the devil and Adam made the bad decision and they fell into sin. But both of their first children and everybody since as David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. He wasn't throwing off on his mama. He wasn't talking bad about his mama. He's just saying, my sweet mother, my good, decent mother is like everybody else. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that's why we have a sin nature, because we inherit a sin nature from our parents. God said, be fruitful and multiply. Secondly, the bed, the marriage bed, uh, human sexuality was designed for pleasure. Now, you notice verse 24 and 25 of Genesis 2. Here, God's pronouncing the marriage service. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Verse 25, and they were both, oh, I'm going to get some blushing on this one. Mm -hmm. They were naked. As, uh, what's the guy's name that uh, wrote those columns in the Atlanta Journal so long? Louis Grizzard. They were naked they were naked and they were up to something. But they were married. It was okay. Preacher, why do you keep being this way? Well, we need to take a deep breath and say, all right, it's okay to talk about this appropriately. And I'm trying to be appropriate. I'm I know I might be stretching your boundaries, but I'm, I think I'm staying within the boundaries of what the scripture would say. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. God intended these two, I don't know how old they were, I guess they're of adult age. God wouldn't perform a wedding for people that weren't. God made them, you know. You say, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Chicken, of course. God created the animals, and he created them whose seed was in itself. It was able to reproduce. And so were Adam and Eve. Human sexuality is given as a means of communicating affection. Now, can I just say this, and I think the women will say amen. Guys, Hugging and kissing is not the only way you can show affection for your wife. And all the women said, all right. I got to take my wife to the Goodwill store every once in a while. She loves that. She loves it. And when we go out to eat, I got to go where she wants to go every once in a while, okay? And she just sometimes just wants to talk. I know, guys. Go make some coffee. <laughs> Drink a full cup. She wants to let somebody understand how she feels. Guys, she's so beautiful and you just, for some reason, you just like to be around her. But she knows one of the reasons she likes to be around you because you're supposed to be caring about her, listening to her, understanding her. Listen to me. If I forget everything else, let me tell you this. You know what loneliness is? Loneliness is the condition in which you don't think anybody understands you or cares. Guys, you want to show affection to your wife? Show her that somehow accidentally through the years, you've actually started a little bit to understand her and that you care about how she feels. 
my wife takes on an attitude of a purring cat when she feels like I've listened to her and I was interested in her. Now, I'm not saying put on, guys. <laughs> this is where you pray. God, please help me to do this right. I've been practicing 48 years, and I'm just beginning, just beginning to learn. My wife will tell you, yeah, he's got a lot to learn. And she's right. She's right. I agree. But human sexuality is part of the package. You keep you only unto him, only unto her. This is an exclusive relationship. I know I don't have time to develop it, but the Bible talks about polygamy. It talks about it. And you know how it talks about it? It reports it, but it never, ever validates it. One man, one woman, one lifetime, okay? But in a mutual monogamous now, we, we, we got a long discussion on what constitutes marriage, and we don't have time. But I'll sit down with you, and I'll show you what constitutes marriage. And it's making a covenant before God and witnesses. And it's a commitment that you plan. And anyways, it, there's a lot there. But in the context of monogamous marriage, human sexuality is a means of communicating affection. And it's, it's pleasant. Now... I am going to read one of the most risque passages of Scripture, except for um, the Song of Solomon. Now, I haven't preached, I, as you notice, I've never preached a, a message out of the Song of Solomon. And uh, one day I'll get enough courage to do that, but I haven't done it yet. And doing this today, you'll either fire me or I'll develop courage and I'll be able to, to speak on the subject. But Proverbs chapter 5, verse 18, put it on the screen. Oh boy, here it comes. Now, don't get upset with me. I didn't write this book. <laughs> God had this book written. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. Now, the book of Psalms and the book of Proverbs are written in a poetic style. This is very metaphorical to teach some pretty deep stuff in a metaphorical way. And the fountain, we're not talking about a well and a fountain. We're talking about let your family, let your life, let your generations that follow you be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. Enjoy her. And by the way, Jesus said it's more blessed to give than receive. Guys, you should make it, and I'm, I'm, this is as far as I'm going to go, you ought to make it a point to, that she enjoys it too. And I'm not going to go any further because I'm already on, I'm in trouble, aren't I? Am I okay? Don't look at me, she says. Because the next verse is going to get more difficult. Let her be as the loving hind and the pleasant roe. Now, the word hind means a doe deer, okay? This is nice, metaphorical, and, you know, my wife's like a beautiful deer. And the book of Proverbs says, let your wife be as a beautiful deer. And by the way, this deer has been beautiful to me for 48 years. And I tell you what, she's as beautiful as the day I married her. Can I just let you in on something? I didn't have to pray this prayer because she's a wonderful person. But early, early on, I prayed, oh God, make it so that I cherish her and love her and delight in her as long as we live. And I want you to know something. God answers that prayer. You want to love your wife the way you ought to love your wife? And by the way, men are commanded to love your wife as Christ loved the church. That's a whole different sermon. But God will answer that prayer. She's going to be a beautiful deer and a pleasant row. Uh, most commentators would say that would be like an ibex, which is a beautiful, graceful, graceful kind of a gazelle. Okay, now the next phrase is going to be kind of metaphorical. Uh, there is a good, wholesome, healthy thing that God designed that's called breastfeeding, and you, do, you feed children that way. You know, we, we don't get embarrassed when you milk a cow, but we understand that humans are capable of producing nourishment for their children. And so in the same way that a child is nourished by his mother, 
A man should be nourished by the love of his wife. And so the st this next statement is metaphorical. Of course, it's poetic uh, language. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times. In other words, you love her. Be happy with her. And of course, listen to me. Do you understand that the kind of love that God has, if you choose to commit your life to love someone, I don't guess I've said this too much publicly. I didn't fall in love with my wife until I married her. I was very fond of her. I liked her a whole lot. But it was through the understanding of who she is and in the relationship we had, the love in me, and I'm sorry to be so personal, but you know, everything's personal. And this is the only way I can say this. The love in me has never stopped growing for this woman. And you say, well, well, preacher, you're weird, you know. You're, you're, you're one of those flawed people that, you know, you're, you're kind of broken and you needed the, yeah. She's my crutch. I don't care. Call her what you want to. People say that our religion is a crutch. Fine. I'm a cripple. I need one. But I don't have religion. I have Jesus. Amen. So it, let her be what is all you need. And you know, when those lewdly dressed people flash across the screen on your television or you make the mistake of walking down a beach where everybody's half naked, you look at the sky and say, I have married a wonderful woman. Amen. Amen. I ain't shopping. I ain't looking. I ain't comparing. Guys, please don't compare your wife to other women. Please don't do that. She won't like it. You will pay for it. And be thou lavished always with her love. In other words, captured, enraptured. In a sense, this little five foot five woman owns me. And I like it that way. Be thou ravished with her love. So preacher, I'm too old for that. No, you're not. You know we do whenever we sit in, in the living room when we're tired and getting ready for, you know, getting, trying to get tired enough to go to bed. We sit there and sometimes we'll watch TV, YouTube. Sometimes we'll watch a video. Sometimes we'll listen to a sermon. You know, what? we sit right next to each other. And that little hand goes out like that and that little hand goes out like that. And we just sit there for hours holding those two little hands. I can't explain it. But I like it. And you would too. Oh, preacher, we, we got so much animosity and so much anger and so much history between us. Yeah. You had a whole lot between you and God too, but he forgave you and he washed you and he has sanctified you. And your relationship can be sanctified. Let me close. The last part of the verse, but marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. It's not a soiled thing. It's, it's okay. It's good in its place, in its place. But whoremongers, that's an English word. It's not a good word for the, the Greek word. I'll tell you what it is in a minute. And adulterers, God will, what? Judge. The word judge, krino, means to conclude guilt, to condemn guilt to sentence guilt. And whether society judges these activities or not, God does. Now, I'm not a judge of people's behavior, but God is a judge. You know, next time somebody says, don't judge me, say, I'm not, but God is. I know, that, that'll win friends and influence people. But I want you to understand that concept. I'm not anybody's judge. There but for the grace of God, go I. I'm not throwing any stones at anybody because I live in a glass house. I'm not without sin. It's not my job to hold a stone. 
It's my job to hold a hand. It's my job to reach out a hand to those in need. But it is God's job to judge. And God does judge sinful behavior. What does he judge? The word for whoremonger, the, Greek, the English word that, it was, uh, that has replaced the, the Greek word is pornos. What does that sound like? Pornos, pornea. What does that sound like? Pornography. Now you got it. The word pornos are, uh, uh, is uh, fornicator is the best English word for that. And that is to participate in human sexuality with someone who is not your wife or your husband. Period. But I'm not married. Then you're a fornicator if you participate in human sexuality outside of the bonds. Well, preacher, we don't do such and such. We just do save it for marriage. Can I say this, young people? If you save it for marriage, it will be special. And it, it, will, be, it will bless you the rest of your life if you wait. The Bible says that flee fornication. Every sin that a man does is outside of the body, lying, stealing. But he that commits fornication sins against his own body. So look at the lineup here. Number one, when you commit fornication, sexuality outside of marriage, period, you sin against God. That's bad enough. Number two, you sin against that other person. You have become a user. You are using them for your gratification. And you know, you got to be careful with that user attitude even in marriage. You need to be considerate. You need to be affectionate. You need to respect each other's feelings and needs. Number three, you are, according to 1 Corinthians 6, 18, you are sinning against your own body. I just don't have time to tell you all the ways that you're sinning against your own body. Now, he also says that God judges adulterers. Now, the only difference between a fornicator and adulterer is that instead of sinning against three entities, you're sinning against four entities. Because the adulterer is a person who is impure, but they're married. And they're participating in human sexuality with someone other than their spouse. And by the way, Jesus said, if you oogle... If you look upon someone to lust after them, you are committing adultery in your heart presently. Remember the doctor telling me that, Mr. Parkin, you're having a heart attack as we speak. And Jesus was saying to them, if you lust after a woman, you are committing adultery as you speak. That's what you're doing right there on the spot. People say, well, why don't I just go ahead and do it? Because I was thinking, that, yeah, okay, you want to be judged for both? Go ahead. I don't say go ahead, no. Avoid sin, because sin does what? Kills. The wages of sin is death. There's all kinds of death. And you just start dying on so many levels when you step out of the boundaries. Remember, God set boundaries for this because it's good. And if you step outside of the boundaries, you're going to get hurt. If you travel to Israel today, what a wonderful thing to see the land of Jesus, the place where he walked the tomb of David, the temple mound. But brother, you better not walk across where that barbed wire and that little sign with that little yellow triangle, you better not go in there because it's a minefield. There's so many mines that have been laid in Israel, it's going to take them decades to get them out of there. I guess they're not going to be out of there until the Prince of Peace comes back and cleans up. In marriage, you stay within the boundaries. And so the adulterer, just like the fornicator, sins against God, sins against the other person, sins against his own body, but then he also sins against his spouse. And God takes covenants seriously. I believe it's in the book of Ecclesiastes or maybe Proverbs. God says, don't make a covenant unless you plan to keep it. Because God has no pleasure in a fool. You're going to marry, you be married. Well, I'm married, but my wife is not. Or I'm married, but my husband is not. Listen to me. Simon Peter had a conversation with Jesus one time, and 
And, and, and Jesus had just told him, Simon, it's going to get rough for you later on. He saw John walk by. He said, what about him? Jesus said, what about him? What is that to you? You keep your covenant. You follow Jesus. And I tell you what, I have worked with people who had some impossible situations. And I have seen marriages that people said would never be reconciled. I've seen them reconciled. I've seen people happier than they were before. And there are situations where they can't be reconciled. But you know what? God's plan B for you is just as good as plan A because when you get to plan B, it suddenly becomes plan A for the rest of your life. So wherever you are in life, respect the covenant of marriage. I close with this. If we had time, we would look in the uh, fifth chapter of uh, Ephesians. Is it the fifth or the sixth? Anyway, it says, Husband, love your wife as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Listen, why is marriage so important? Because marriage is an earthly picture of our heavenly relationship. Guys, do you know what we're going to be called when we get to heaven? Are you ready for this? Do you know? The bride of Christ. Zach, you don't look like a bride. No, sir. No, so Heather looks much more like a bride than you do. Why did God call us the bride of Christ? Because he wants us to understand he's going to hold to us forever. He's never going to let go. He's going to love us and cherish us, and he is going to nurture us. And so you see, marriage is that picture. Christian marriage is an evangelistic tool. It says to the world, this is the love of God. He wants you to become a bride to his son in the sense that you're going to be joined to somebody that's going to love you for eternity. There's nothing unmasculine about this. It's just good. But this is why Christian marriage is so important. And so the writer of Hebrews gets to the point, takes one verse and says, this is it. Read all about it. Now go and do likewise. Amen? Maybe God's spoken to your heart this morning. Maybe you're here today and you, you'd have to say, Preacher, I'm not the bride of Christ yet. I, I believe about Jesus, but I've never, I've never known him. I've never been close to him. I've never experienced the new birth. You can come today. Jesus gave his life for his bride that he might sanctify her and purify her and make her a beautiful bride without spot and without blemish. And that's what he can do for you if you turn to him in simple childlike faith.